I'm Rachel Pfizer. I'm an OBGYN at OBGYN Associates of Holland. And today we're going to be talking about hypertension in pregnancy. So a few objectives. First, we're going to talk about the prevalence of hypertension in pregnancy, some of the risk factors that can increase your risk for developing high blood pressure in pregnancy, some of the causes, um, ways that we can try to prevent you from developing hypertension, and uh, then we're going to talk about a little bit of um, information about some of the conditions that involve high blood pressure in pregnancy. There are a few, including pre-existing, or we call it chronic hypertension, which is when you have high blood pressure prior to pregnancy, or other conditions that can develop during pregnancy, um, including gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, preeclampsia with severe features, HELP syndrome, and eclampsia. Talk a little bit about the effects that high blood pressure has for mom and baby during pregnancy, timing of delivery for these different conditions, and some considerations for the postpartum period. So why is hypertension a problem? It is the leading cause of maternal morbidity and mortality worldwide and neonatal morbidity and mortality worldwide. About 2 to 8% of pregnancies are complicated by high blood pressure or preeclampsia, and it accounts for about 16% of maternal deaths. In the United States, preeclampsia rates have increased about 25% between the year 1987 and 2004. Um, that continues to increase. And it's also a very costly condition for um, the healthcare system and our country. In 2012, hypertension care in pregnancy and for the 12 months postpartum, um, including infant care, cost about $2.18 billion. So there are multiple risk factors for developing high blood pressure in pregnancy. One of them is if it's your first pregnancy, you're at a higher risk of developing high blood pressure. Obesity, especially with a BMI over 30. If you have multiple babies at the same time, twins, triplets, etc. If you've conceived through in vitro fertilization or IVF, that can increase your risk. In age 35 years or older. If you've had preeclampsia or high blood pressure complicating a previous pregnancy, you're at an increased risk of having that again. If you have high blood pressure prior to pregnancy, um, diabetes prior to pregnancy, if you develop diabetes during the pregnancy, which is called gestational diabetes, if you have a um, rheumatoid problem or an autoimmune disorder like lupus or other things like that that can increase your risk, blood clotting disorders that are pre-existing prior to pregnancy, kidney disease or obstructive sleep apnea can all increase your risks. So some of those things are things that we can try to prevent or work on. Other things are um, non-modifiable risk factors. In terms of the causes of high blood pressure in pregnancy, there are a few that, we're, that we think may contribute. Um, environmental factors, genetic factors, um, potentially something with the immune system and how it responds during the pregnancy puts certain people at risk for developing high blood pressure, or potentially the way that the blood flows through the placenta. Um, maybe there's an increase in pressure in the blood flow through the placenta that causes these other things to happen that will lead the mom to have high blood pressure. Overall, the mechanism for developing high blood pressure is not fully understood at this point, but these are uh, major areas that we're looking at. So one of the main things that we can do to prevent high blood pressure in pregnancy is to start someone who has risk factors on a low-dose aspirin during pregnancy. Um, ACOG is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. SMFM is the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And the USPTF is the US Preventative Task Force. They all recommend starting this low-dose aspirin during pregnancy. It's been well studied to prevent or delay the onset of developing high blood pressure or preeclampsia. Um, most of the time we just use an 81 milligram baby aspirin daily. And that's for patients who are at a moderate to high risk of developing high blood pressure. Usually we start this at the end of the first trimester, around 12 weeks. Ideally you want to start it before, the, before 16 weeks of pregnancy to give you the best result. So I've included a chart here. This is from ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. This is um, stratifying the different risks of who may, be, uh, who may benefit from starting a low-dose aspirin. So it groups these risks into high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. And this is how we determine 
if a patient needs to be on aspirin or not during the pregnancy. So a lot of these things are things that I mentioned in terms of risk factors for developing high blood pressure, like a history of preeclampsia, um, having twins or triplets or multiple babies at the same time, a history of high blood pressure prior to pregnancy, diabetes, those sorts of things put you in that high risk category. Um, moderate risk factors, usually if you have two or more of these, that's when we would consider starting an aspirin. So those are things like this is your first pregnancy, um, obesity, a family history of preeclampsia, those types of things. If you've had a previous uncomplicated delivery, then usually we don't put you on an aspirin. So chronic hypertension, we, we touched on this a little bit. That means that you have high blood pressure existing before pregnancy. It can also mean that you develop high blood pressure during your pregnancy before 20 weeks gestation. Or if you develop hypertension or high blood pressure during pregnancy and then it does not go away after you deliver, usually within that six weeks postpartum, that can also be considered chronic hypertension. The way we diagnose chronic hypertension is with a blood pressure reading of greater than 140 for the top number or systolic blood pressure or greater than or equal to 90 for the bottom number on your blood pressure or diastolic pressure. We have to have those on two separate occasions, more than four hours apart to give you that diagnosis. We consider it a severe blood pressure reading if the top number is 160 or higher or if the bottom number is 110 or higher. There are some new guidelines that were put out by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association for diagnosing high blood pressure in non-pregnant patients. Um, they, they've classified these into stages, and stage one hypertension is actually defined as 130 to 139 for the top number or 80 to 89 for the bottom number. So that's different than our definition that we use in pregnancy. Those definitions have not yet been studied and how that affects pregnancy. If patients who are pregnant who have blood pressures in those ranges, if they have any difference in outcome in their pregnancy or not, we're not sure. So that can confuse things a little bit if a patient's been diagnosed using that criteria and then they get pregnant. So when do we treat patients with chronic hypertension during pregnancy? This can be a little bit of a gray zone. There are no strict guidelines for cutoffs for numbers of when you need to start a medication. Usually we, we treat to prevent you from having a severe range blood pressure or that 160 over 110. Sometimes patients with high blood pressure that is pre-existing to pregnancy don't need medication, especially early in pregnancy. The normal uh, response for your body is to actually lower your blood pressure in the first and second trimesters. So a lot of times um, they can go off of their medications. Patients with chronic hypertension or pre-existing high blood pressure can also develop we call it superimposed preeclampsia. So those patients can still develop preeclampsia on top of their pre-existing high blood pressure. Things for patients who have high blood pressure prior to pregnancy that we need to consider. Uh, review of medications. Not all blood pressure medications are safe during pregnancy. Diet and exercise prior to pregnancy can help decrease your risk of developing preeclampsia. And optimizing your blood pressures prior to pregnancy is important as well. When you do become pregnant, usually we'll check some baseline lab work to check your liver function, your electrolytes, kidney function, and the amount of protein in your urine. That's just to give us an idea of where your numbers are to begin with. And it can help us diagnose preeclampsia later if those numbers start to change in the pregnancy. So moving on to gestational hypertension, that's when you develop high blood pressure after 20 weeks. Again, the same sort of criteria that we used to diagnose chronic hypertension in terms of the number for your blood pressure, 140 for the top number or 90 or higher for the bottom number, two separate occasions, greater than four hours apart. No lab abnormalities with those labs that I mentioned before or symptoms of preeclampsia. It's important to know that up to 50% of these women will go on to develop preeclampsia. I think of it like a spectrum um, with gestational hypertension at the lower end of the spectrum. Some signs and symptoms of preeclampsia would be headaches, especially if they don't go away with pain medication, changes in your vision like blurry vision, flashes of light, dark spots in your vision, pain in the right upper abdomen under your rib cage, trouble breathing, 
nausea, vomiting, especially if that got better for you early in pregnancy and then it returns in the third trimester. Or sudden weight gain, sudden swelling in your face, hands, or feet. Or sometimes I just have patients come in and they say that they don't feel well. And we check those labs and check their blood pressure and find out that they have preeclampsia. So diagnosing preeclampsia, again, same sort of cutoff for the blood pressure. Um, but for this, usually we also see protein in your urine. So that's why we check a urine sample to check for that. If there's no protein in the urine, we can still diagnose you with preeclampsia if there are other changes in your lab work, like elevated liver enzymes, um, lower platelets. Platelets are the part of your blood that help your blood clot. Sometimes that can drop during preeclampsia. Or if we test your kidney function and that level is elevated, those can be diagnostic as well. And then the next step up from that is something called preeclampsia with severe features. Same criteria that we use to diagnose preeclampsia, but you can have severe range blood pressures with this, so the 160 or higher for the top number, 110 or higher for the bottom number, and then some of those symptoms that we talked about as well, the headache that doesn't go away with pain medication, visual changes, fluid in the lungs or trouble breathing, those types of symptoms put you more in that severe category. With preeclampsia with severe features, we do a couple of things differently than we would for just preeclampsia. Uh, we have to make sure that your blood pressure is controlled because if it's not, then you're at a higher risk of having a stroke. So we use IV or oral medications to help control your blood pressure. And then we usually start on an IV magnesium medicine to help prevent seizures. Women with preeclampsia are at a higher risk of having seizures. Oftentimes, depending on what um, gestational age or how far along you are in your pregnancy, we often will work towards delivery. It depends on how far along you are and how severe the blood pressures are, et cetera. One severe form of preeclampsia is called HELP syndrome, and that stands for hemolysis, which means breaking down blood products. Your body starts to break down those platelets that we talked about, elevated liver enzymes, and low, uh, low platelets. This can be very serious. Women can get very sick from this. Um, it's associated with an increased maternal morbidity and mortality. You may not present with hypertension or protein in your urine with HELP syndrome. Sometimes it can be kind of a, an atypical presentation with this. A lot of times patients will present with that upper abdominal pain on the right side, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, or just not feeling like themselves. We treat this like preeclampsia with severe features, so we give you medications for your blood pressure if necessary and that IV magnesium. Eclampsia is a serious complication of high blood pressure in pregnancy, and this is when um, a patient has a seizure. May or may not be preceded by any symptoms of preeclampsia. Typically it is, but it doesn't have to be. And then again, we give you IV magnesium to treat or prevent these from happening again and then oftentimes we work towards delivery. Some effects of high blood pressure on mom include a risk of stroke, we talked about that, a risk of seizure, risk of death, risk of heart attack, fluid in the lungs causing difficulty breathing, and kidney and liver injury, but these are reversible after delivery. Delivery of the um, baby and the placenta are the treatment for preeclampsia or these high blood pressure problems during pregnancy. Some of the effects of high blood pressure on the baby include growth restrictions. So uh, a lot of times with these patients, we'll check growth ultrasounds throughout their pregnancy to make sure that the baby is still growing well. Placental abruption is when the placenta starts to separate from the uterus. And that is pretty rare, but can be very serious. A low fluid level of amniotic fluid around the baby, preterm delivery, or non-reassuring fetal status. So um, sometimes we talked about the change in blood flow through the placenta. Sometimes if the blood flow is decreased to the baby, that would show signs of stress when we put baby on the monitor. In terms of timing of delivery, it's very dependent on what type of hypertension uh, or which classification of high blood pressure you have during pregnancy, if your blood pressures are well controlled or not, um, how many weeks along you are, those types of things. So. We don't have to go through the details of this, but it, I just wanted to highlight that the timing of delivery may change based on how severe the blood pressures are or um, different things that are developing. Usually the more severe the blood pressure, the earlier we get you delivered. 
and some postpartum considerations. Um, sometimes these patients require blood pressure medication after delivery. Oral blood pressure medications are often prescribed for patients as they're going home after their hospital stay. And typically we'll have you come back to the office in a, a few days to a week to check your blood pressure. That may happen weekly until your blood pressure normalizes. We'll evaluate to uh, see if you need to continue the medication after delivery. Um, monitoring for any symptoms of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia and eclampsia may even develop after delivery. That's not very common, but I, um, sometimes we'll see those postpartum patients return with symptoms of preeclampsia. Usually the blood pressures will normalize after about six weeks from delivery. But if this high blood pressure continues, then that's when we consider it chronic hypertension. So a few take home points. If you have pre-existing high blood pressure and you're considering pregnancy, it's important to contact your doctor prior to becoming pregnant or early in pregnancy to go through your blood pressure medications, make sure that they're the appropriate ones for, for pregnancy um, and other ways to try to optimize your care. The earlier you can get in to see your doctor, the better. Focus on those modifiable risk factors that we talked about, exercise, diet, trying to get your blood pressures well controlled before pregnancy, and knowing the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia and when to call your doctor during pregnancy. So again, I'm Rachel Pfizer. I'm an OBGYN at OBGYN Associates of Holland. If you'd like to know more information, you can go to our website or call our office. Thank you.